This is the third and the last episode of our nine best practices I'm using when I'm building a library. And today we're going to talk about when to async and not async, project files, and versioning strategy. So first, when to async and not async. So I follow really the, the common mantras here that we have in the industry, which is when we do network calls, receiving or emitting, then I will use async. Or if an API might use in the future, usually I start it with async because changing async later sometimes can be kind of a pain when it cascades back up. And then for everything else, I'm going to use this sync. And even for files, actually, I'm using local files access. I'm using sync calls and I'm not trying to use async calls. Because one of the big benefits of async in the network calls is we're taking advantage of the operating system non-blocking I.O., which allows us to basically having our task, not paying a tax when the data is waiting to be transmitted. So that is the whole thing about the non-blocking, is that we can have much higher concurrency because all of this lull time are not taxing anything uh, at the operating system, CPU kind of stuff. So that allows us to kind of make many more calls. And sometime, and this, honestly, I go back and forth on that, is on the inter-process call, which means that if I have a call to another process, for example, a common call on an FFmpeg, I might turn them into a Tokyo process call. But here I go back and forth. I'm not really sure there's really kind of a high value of that. And also sometimes when I use SQLite with RescueLite, which is an amazing crate, I actually wrap it into a sync, even if SQLite, rightfully so, doesn't have a async API. It's a sync. But I wrap it in async because for me, it fits better into the model controller kind of infrastructure. So I wrap those into a sync. But that can be debatable either way. And then there's probably some rare use cases, other use cases where I think will be useful, but honestly, I haven't really found them. I'm sure that in advanced programming, there are some. So it's not about being too dogmatic about what goes where, but typically I like to start here and then for network calls, I'm here. And then sometime I make exception here. That is kind of the gist of it. Okay, so now let's go to the project files. So the project files here, we're going to take our Gen AI, which is the library that I'm maintaining. So it's a good example. And as I was saying in the previous episode, we have the examples here, which is a documentation in a way, or at least the entry point of the documentation of a library. So people can look at it. And I like to have my C00 readme, which I'm going to put in the readme. We're going to see that later. That's my examples. And normally it's like that, such as people follow the stories but doesn't have to be numbered as long as, you know, the name describe the function is great and makes them very focus on one particular function. It's always awesome. Then I have the source, obviously. We want that. We went through that on the previous episode. And then we have our test with our support. That is kind of the structure of library. Then on the project files, we have this git ignore. And that is my strategy. I'm not saying it's for everybody but it works very well for me for all my projects, TypeScript, Java, and Rust, and everything. Mostly our Rust now. And um, I have, I ignore everything that starts with a dot, except if I opt in into it. So in this one, for example, I say, I want obviously the git ignore, because otherwise that wouldn't work, obviously. But all the dot and star is ignored by default. And that is great because already in all my repos, I don't have the dot DS stores. So that's good of Mac. And then also, sometimes I have, and I don't show it here because it would be confusing, but I have a dot nodes or something like that. And I know that when I start with dot, it's mine and it's not checked in. Now, I have some exception here, which is the dot cargo, which is pretty cool when we want to put, to set environment variables. So that's why I have it over there. Now, the next one here is basically the same thing with a dash. And that is very personal again. So don't use that if you think it doesn't make sense. I exclude those guys because those guys are not really needed. And then the important part is this one. By default, when we do a new cargo, we have target like that. The problem of that is that that will ignore target on the route from the route, but it won't ignore target if it's down 
a folder hierarchy. And that can cause problem when we have mono repo. So like for me, I like to have the slash at the end. It's much more aggressive and will catch all the target. I don't see the use case. I mean, there might be, but a use case where we want to have a target subfolder somewhere, but not a target root. So for me, that is much more uh, safe. And then I kind of safety net all of these files and directories that might be big and might cause problem. Because it's always a pain when you have something in GitHub that is big and to remove it, it's always a little adventure here. So I don't like that. So I'm trying to have a safety net. It's not, you know, foolproof, but it can catch some stuff. Now, obviously, I don't tap that by hand. On the VS Code Rust 10x extension, I have the min here, just for those guys. And then I have the more that usually I use for my project. So that is the two guys that I have. Okay, so now we go to our cargo to ML. Cargo to ML, we have the dash WIP, which is work in progress. So usually what I like to do, and I've, I've done a video about this, is I like to have the version full number without dash something only on one commit, the commit of the release. And then just after I do a commit where I do a dash work in progress. And then this way, I know exactly when kind of the commit is a commit of the release, or I can go to cargo to ML and I see that this is not the 0.1.8 or 0.7, it's a work in progress on 0.8. So that is kind of the strategy. And then I have the unsafe code for bid. I do not give myself the right to do unsafe code. I haven't coded C++ for a very long time or C for a very long time. So that is not something I want to play around with. And this is why I am on Rust. And then I have that, that I toggle on and on. So I use that. I say that a lot in my best practices, but basically when I start a project, I often mute the uh, allow a warning and then, I mean, the unused warning. And then when the project mature or before the commit, then I turn it on. And then I have my dependencies like that. And I like to do a little uh, code section like this, such as organize. That is kind of my way. Now, on the change log one, we have this notation and I made a video here. I'm going to put it over there. And basically I have this commit best practices where dot is for minor, dash is for fix and so on. And then here I have my version. And this is come from the Git log somewhat, but has a human, myself, the author of the lib, editorial kind of edition. Yeah, so where I'm going to change and I'm going to fine tune what I think will make sense for a user to see. So it's not only the diff, which, you know, GitHub has great diff between two uh, version tag, but it's more uh, something that has been edited and cherry picked and sometimes rewarded. Or here I'm adding API change, which is not in the commit, but I'm putting it there. So that is kind of the best practice here. And I don't do a change log for all of my libraries, only for the one that I maintain quite a bit more than the other one. On the license part, uh, I have the Apache and the MIT. So that is very common in the Rust community. There is one license, I don't really remember which one, that has the same effect as the all of both of them, but it's less common, so people are not really sure about them. So this way, it's, you know, there's less question. People expect that when they see open source in Rust. So this is a great way to start. Then I have the readme with these ugly kind of things. That is a shield. But then that will give us kind of this nice view over there. And I like to have my GitHub because sometimes this allows me to jump into the GitHub repo quickly uh, when I am on this uh, VS code. So. That is the things, and I'm telling here in this case, and we're going to talk about the versioning strategy, but here I'm saying which one to, to put in. And sometimes I don't always have that, but I do have that because here I'm recommending people to lock it for now, for the 0.1.x. And then very important, last but not least, is we have the Rust FMT. So when we are doing a library and we want people to contribute to, or we like people to contribute to, um, it's important to have that, such as you have your style, the style of author prime, obviously. Um, and then when people kind of edit the code and everything, they don't have to think about it. They, the thing will be formatted mostly rightly, and we are not going to have other kind of formatting issues in the commit that will be distracting. And so for me, I like to have tabs, no comment, and then um, all the other kind of fine tuning. So that is kind of a little bit the strategy. 
And that's it. That is my project files. Now, on the last step is to talk about the cargo to email, which is actually our versioning. So the versioning strategy here that I have, and I put it in the readme, is that um, the 0.1.x, which is a .z, we still have some breaking changes into the .x. And the reason why is because as Rust developers, I don't like the big 1.0 here, because in a way I feel that once I have a 1.0, I need to have a huge justification to go to the big 2.0. So that's why I personally do not like to have the thing 1.0. I agree, it's not really a good reason, but that's mine. And it's kind of, I'm not saying it's the same one in the Rust community, but the Rust community also is pretty shy about this big one, the big number, and they tend to stay there. And then these numbers tend to scale kind of pretty high. And typically, it's a very good practice to say that the only time you can break a release is when you go from 31 to, I mean, to 30 to 31. And those are the patches. And so that's kind of really the stuff. And those are the big ones that change the thing. So the minor version, which in our case here, because it's zero, it's become kind of almost a major, the major. So, but the problem of that is that often when you start maturing a library, you don't want to say, well, you know, it's very mature at 15 and at 14 or 15. And then before it was kind of in the maturing process. So the strategy that I have is to say, well, I'm going to have the 0.1.x and that will be saying that all the X can might break um, compatibility. But then after once I am in two and above, then I'm going to follow the same var in a more kind of uh, appropriate way. So that is a little bit my strategy. I think it doesn't really matter either way. The thing which is very important is to be very clear in the readme, such as people knows what to expect. So as long as we have clarity and consistency, we are usually good in software. So, and then we don't want to go too far from the norm, obviously, but this one is not too, too far from the norm and it's relatively clear. So again, I'm not saying this is a good strategy, just mine that I started to use and I think it works pretty well. And um, that's it. And that will conclude this episode. That was kind of a short one, but I just wanted to conclude the three parts. I hope you liked it. Subscribes and likes help a lot. Until next one, happy coding.